Amen. Revelation 14. Okay, so we come up to this book, Revelation 14, this chapter. There's a lot going on in this chapter. You can't give it really a timeline in a way as it's going to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. All right? There's a lot involved in here. So let's speed things up. You have John, who is on the island of Patmos, and he's there because he's banished uh, from sharing the gospel with the world. And so uh, the authorities put him on this island. You know, at least a guy can't do any damage on an island. There's nobody there. Stick him on this island and leave him. So there he is. And, and Jesus Christ comes down and reveals himself to him sends an angel to go and say, record what you see. So we have Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. You have this divine outline of what the book of Revelation is about. He says, write down the things which you see. And what he saw was Jesus Christ revealed as the grace and mercy and love of God for all mankind. Then he says, write down the things which are. And what is that? We saw it was church history, the letters that go out to the seven churches, each one representing a period of church history throughout the whole uh, New Testament church era, ending with the Laodicean church, which is our historical period, okay? showing us that we're in a very end time time. Then he says, write down the things which will be after these things, meaning after the last church historical period. Now write down what's going to take place after that church is gone. And the first thing we see is chapters 4 and 5. The church is brought up into heaven. And when the church, that's the rapture of the church, the lifting up of the church to be in heaven with her Lord, the bride of Christ being lifted up. And as the bride of Christ is lifted up, John begins to see the judgment of the Lamb pouring out upon a Christ-rejected world. And as, it, as we've seen all these uh, seals that are broken open and the, vi and, the, and the judgments are poured forth, a third of mankind is destroyed, a third of the earth, a third of the water. I mean, it's just horrendous things that are going on on the earth at this time. It brings us to this place in chapter 14 where we just saw last week that the Antichrist has made a mark, and he's made this kind of mark that's going to be on the right hand and the forehead. And the mark, is, it's representing, it's not so much the number, okay, because we looked at that last week. If you weren't here, get the CD. It's, it's choosing an authority over you. It's coming down to making a choice when you don't have the Holy Spirit to support you. A time during the tribulation where the power and authority of God's spirit is no longer active and alive in believers. It's just men and women choosing to trust Jesus Christ instead of this other Messiah that has raised himself up who has brought peace to the whole earth. And so we're going to be forced to make a decision. Jesus Christ or this false Messiah. And when you choose the false Messiah, you're stamped. Somehow, there's something put on your forehead or your right hand. And anybody that receives that stamp is doomed for eternity. Everybody hear that? Doomed. <laughs> if you receive it, you've made a choice. Because as soon as that stamp goes out, this grand false father figure, this antichrist, begins to change his tune. As soon as the stamp is stamped, that means all of mankind has made a choice. I choose to follow the false Messiah because he's brought peace to the earth and he's made me happy. Or I choose to follow Jesus Christ. Well, you're going to give your life up to do that. You're going to die. But you'll go to heaven for eternity. That's God's promise. You take that stamp. As soon as the stamp goes, everything turns around. In the tribulation, the Antichrist then becomes revealed and everybody realizes what just happened. This grand figure turns against mankind. 
And when that happens, we have Revelation chapter 14, an amazing picture that's painted for us. We're going to walk through it because there's a lot of different pictures painted in this word. Look at verse 1 through 5. It says, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except for the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. They are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes, and these have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the lamb, and no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. Okay, This is a, the character of those who are led by the lamb, the 144,000. The first thing I see as I'm walking through this word is he says in verse 1, Then I looked and behold the lamb, this is an amazing statement right here. You just had the beast that stamped most of mankind. And they've, they've received his authority. And all of a sudden, now everything begins to turn. And he makes this statement. He looks over and he says, behold, the lamb. And, and it goes back to, you know, uh, the book of John. I'm going to read it to you. Because the first time the Jews, the 144,000, they're Jewish men. But the first time the Jews were offered the lamb, he was a man. He was a bloody, broken man. Okay? I'm going to read it to you from John chapter 19. It says, Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a purple robe on him and they began to come up to him and shout to him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they gave him slaps in the face and... Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns, the purple robes. He's dressed as a king. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. The term is ecce homo. Pilate presented Jesus Christ as king over the Jews. He was a bloody, broken disfigured man they beat him they stuck a crown of thorns on his head to mock him to ridicule him and what they didn't realize these jewish men as they looked up and said crucify him pilate just showed them the lamb of god who was going to take away the sin of the world and they said crucify him let his blood be on us pilate says i find no guilt in this man you know, Isaiah 53 tells us he was led as a lamb to his slaughter. He was innocent before men. There was no guilt found in him at all. And when I look here in Revelation chapter 14, John is saying that the, the 144,000 are standing there, Jewish men. They're looking and they're realizing this is him. This is Eche Homo, the one we rejected. And what does that lamb look like? We saw it back in the early part of Revelation. The lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's up in heaven. He's the one that took the scroll out of him who sits upon the throne. He was a lamb as sacrificed, which means he was a bloody, beaten, broken lamb. He wasn't a puffy little white lamb. He was a bloody lamb. And John says here, behold the lamb. He's standing on Mount Zion, and there's 144,000 standing before him. Something happens here in these people's lives, these 144,000, that will never happen in our life. It's beyond what words can express. We have his spirit, we have his mercy, we have his grace, and it covers us by faith. None of us are able to grab him by the hand and look him into the face until we get there. We have faith, and that's all we have to go on. Our trust and our belief that what the Word of God says is true, and we have the comfort of His Spirit backing that up. 
But these men, these 144,000 men, are going to see him face to face as a bloody, broken Messiah who unconditionally loves them. If you ever sat down to think about how much God loves you in spite of your sin, how much he truly loves you in spite of what your past has been, and him knowing our future still unconditionally loves us, that's a love that takes our hearts captive and says, wow, Lord, you're, you're unbelievably awesome. You're so full of grace. You're so magnificent. You're so glorious. You're just, you, you're my Lord. And I, I willingly bow before you. Do what you want in my life. I trust you. But these 144,000, they have a more personal, intimate relationship because they know who he was as a man, and they rejected him. And then they come to see him now as a lamb, and they receive him holy. And then we begin to see the character of what these 144,000 are. And it's an amazing picture that's painted uh, for you and I. It says uh, he had the 144,000, verse 1, having his name in the name of his father written on their foreheads. Okay, name means character and authority. So the statement there, how is the, it's on his, his their foreheads and in, in, uh, the, the father, him and his father. It just simply means with these 144,000, everything they do from now on will be for him. Every single thing they do will be for him and for his people because they are holy his. This is something God would desire you and I to be today. And it's very hard because we can be tossed from one side or the other. We still have that spiritual battle. I have a lot of flesh in me and I have spirit in me. And for the rest of my life on this earth, they will battle each other for my soul. Now my soul, that's where Christ dwells and I am, he settled there as Lord in my life, but the flesh will never, ever, ever give up trying to conquer that which I've surrendered over for Christ. The 144,000 are not gonna have that problem. That's something we have to deal with. That's where faith comes in. I heard it put this way uh, pretty well. You have this battle in the flesh and the spirit uh, how do you let one lead you? How do you let one wholly conquer your life so you follow? And, and the analogy was, was two dogs. Let's say you have two dogs, a white dog and a black dog. And each one is equal in strength. Each one is equal in power. Each one is equal in authority. Yet each one is going to battle to pull you down a direction in life. So how do you know which one to follow? Or how do you, you know, you want to follow the right one? Well, it's the one you feed. If you stop feeding one, the other one gets stronger. If I stop feeding my flesh, it becomes weak. Now, when my flesh becomes weak, I look foolish to the world. But yet, it's my foolishness that brings glory to God, believe it or not. That's what the Word of God teaches us. If I feed my spirit, I become nurtured in the word of God. I'm in fellowship with God's people. I'm not living for my glory anymore. I'm giving up my will. I'm trusting Jesus Christ. No matter what, my spirit becomes stronger. And I begin to be pulled down the road that God wants me to walk down. It's real simple. We have that in our life. And we're going to have to deal with that for the rest of our life. But these 144,000... They will not have that problem. They are wholly, completely committed over to Christ. And, and it's an amazing thing that happens in their life. Look at, uh, it says verse 2, And I heard the voice from heaven like, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder. And the, it was like the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne. Um, before the living creatures. No one could sing it except them. This is really cool. They, they sing a new song. This is a song that no one else can sing. It's a song of redemption, and it's based on they've been redeemed. They've been forgiven and redeemed, and they know it. 
And what comes out of their heart, you know, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. And they sing what's in their heart. And it comes out. And it's a song that no one else can sing because they have been redeemed in such a way, greater than even us. Then they sing it, and it's a powerful, powerful song that echoes through all of heaven. John said, it was like the sound of many waters. You know, my wife and I went to Niagara Falls, and it was really cool at the top. When you get into that in the maid of the mist, you know, and you go down, and not only do you get absolutely soaked, but you're trying to just, she's standing right next to me because there's a thousand people on the boat. And she's like, nice falls! I'm like, yeah, this is awesome! And I could barely hear her. You know why? Because we're at the bottom of the falls where you have an enormous amount of water going, can't hear nothing. And, and this song in heaven is so powerful coming from the heart of these 144,000. It is echoing out in a powerful way that nothing else can be heard. It's a powerful song of redemption. You know what that means? He said, it's like harpists playing their harp. It had a melody to it. It had a tune. It spoke. You know, back in the original Hebrew, when, when David played the harp, there were, there were 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and there were 22 strings on the harp. And that's what they played. They played the words. You know, they played the letters of the words. And it came out as a melody. And they sang it to whatever it is. You know, today we write songs today and we take this captive tune and we have this nice melody and everybody can sing it and it's cool. They played what came out. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, <laughs> An amazing thing. But you know where it came out of? Here. Hey, listen, church. What song is in your heart today? What song's coming out of your lips? That The song that glorifies what God has done to you in Christ. What's the song that echoes out and billows out? We sing many of them. Some of the songs from the newsboys. I like their old stuff. Some of the stuff that Peter Furler wrote. I love this song, Devotion. It, it echoes in my heart. I love some of that stuff. Those songs. That came out of his heart because that's what's alive in his heart. What song do you sing throughout the day? And does it drown out the world when it begins to try to cut you down? Let the song echo out of what your redemption means to you. The 144,000, they give us a great picture of, of what a life is that's, that's centered over to Christ. Look at verse 4. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. They are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. And these have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. This is pretty awesome. It implies that these 144,000 are separated out of the earth. The term literally means earth dwellers. They're not earth dwellers, meaning this. They're not living for this world anymore. They're not living for what they can get out of their life on this world. They're living in the midst of the tribulation among evil men, yet their heart, inside their heart, they're citizens of heaven. They're no longer part of this world's system. That's what this means there at the beginning. Then you have the term, they're, they're not defiled with women. Okay? It, this doesn't imply some kind of insult to women or to marriage or to a sexual relationship. Right? This, these men are not chauvinists. They're celibates. That's what it means. And it simply means that they have given themselves over or they have kept themselves for the Lord. This intimacy I have kept for my Lord. That's what it means. Real simple. And that's what these 144,000 are. They're committed to Christ. It says they follow the lamb wherever he goes. That means they're committed to following the lamb wherever he would lead them on the earth. Hey, you go to China. Okay. Oh, there's no more boats. Well, swim. It doesn't matter. I'll go. I will go wherever you send me to go. Remember the term, the term Lord? We say it about Jesus all the time. It's amazing to me that, that people, you know, they say Jesus is not God. 
but you call him Lord, right? Lord means you bow down before him. Like the knights in, in the round table around King Arthur. Which knight inside King Arthur's group would have stood before King Arthur when he requested to see him and to give him a command to go follow? None of them. They come in and they bow down before him. My Lord, what is your bid for my life? Because I live for no other reason. That's what these 144,000 are. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They're committed to following him. It says they're the first fruits of the harvest, means they will go out to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And an amazingly, we've already seen it, part of it in, in Revelation, um, they, they speak in a great multitude beyond human ability to number, respond to their message. It says people from every tribe, every nation, every group, every tongue, they come to know Jesus Christ. I was talking to the guys this morning as we were praying for service, and uh, we're talking about languages, and when I was preparing this, when it says every group, every people, every tribe, every tongue, okay, it means that these are Jewish men. They probably don't know every language in the world. But like when the, when the Holy Spirit came down in the book of Acts and, and on the day of Pentecost and they began to speak in tongues, they were speaking languages to all the people that were there from all the different parts of the countries. And they were hearing in their own language the glory of God and the good news of the gospel. And the same picture is here for the 144,000. I'm going to send you to China. I don't know Chinese. That's irrelevant. Guess who does? God. Guess who created every known language to mankind? Guess. God, back in the Tower of Babel, he confused their tongue. He gave them languages. He gave them each one, except for Klingon, because <laughs> that was man-made. That was created. And the elfish one from the Lord of the Rings, that's all man-made. That's, that's entertainment language. But every known language to mankind, God created. And when he sends out the 144,000 and they go out and they reach every people's group, every single one, every language, every nation, every tongue, and they proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the multitude that gets saved during that tribulation time is greater than anyone could ever count. An amazing thing. Uh, that, that happens there. It says, no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless, which means they're transformed men. They're born again. They've been cleansed. They've been changed by God's grace in a miraculous way. So these redeemed Jews fully recognize their crucified Messiah, Jesus Christ, and they have wholly committed their lives to him. That's the 144,000. Now, there's all kinds of different cult groups out there, and they proclaim to be part of the 144,000. Sorry, that's not true. These are Jewish men from 12,000 from every tribe of the nation of Israel, and they are wholly committed to Jesus Christ. They're not committed to some society. They're not committed to some group. They're not committed to some religious facade. They're committed to Jesus Christ wholly and completely as their Messiah. So that's the picture that John sees of the 144,000. Now we go into verse 6 and 7. He's going to have an angel here. It says, And I saw another angel flying in midheaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation, tribe, and tongue, and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory. Because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Okay, here in verses 6 and 7. So these 144,000, they have done their job and they're with the lamb. And they're going to go be with the lamb wherever the lamb goes. So their job on the earth is done. And so God says, okay, angel, go proclaim it because I'm going to give mankind still an opportunity. 
Go proclaim it from the skies. And the angels go out and they begin to proclaim even from the sky. Worship him. This is God. Worship God. Worship him who created everything. An amazing statement that's there. What does that tell us about the creator of all things? You know, the statement is fear God for he's created everything. In fact, in the book of John chapter 1, says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. He's saying, Fear God, for he created all things. So he's showing this lamb, and he's saying, fear God. This is God, right? Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power. He says, this grace given to me to preach the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ among the nations and to bring to light what is the fellowship of the mystery from eternity that has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the creator of all things. He not only died for our sins, he created us because the Father asked him to. He created all the plants. Why? Because he's God. You go through Isaiah. We've been through it many times. You go from like verse chapter 30 all the way up to 46. And and God's going to say over and over, I am the Lord your God, the creator, the only savior of Israel. I am the Lord your God. I am the holy one of Israel, your savior. I created all things. On and on and on he goes through Isaiah. Showing us this is Jesus Christ who came in flesh, represented God to us, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the angel here proclaims to the world the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ and he does it in such a way as he's showing the world who, who believe, you know, they don't believe in Jesus, but they, what they, their focus is the earth. And, and the angel's going, God, Jesus, this Lamb, created everything you're standing on is your last chance you know don't take that mark don't do it worship him fear him not the other one you know amazing there look at verse eight he sees another angel it says a second one following saying fallen fallen is babylon the great she who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality And then another angel, a third one followed, uh, followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives the mark on his forehead or his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in its full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever And they have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Uh, An amazing thing. What we have here, okay, we have the consequences of those branded by the beast. This is really important because there are going to be people alive during that tribulation time that are going to look at this beast who looks to them like the greatest father figure in the world the one who's brought peace to the whole earth, the one who, who, is, who has brought and united all religions and nations together, and they're going to go, I'll take that. I stand for you. I'm not going to follow this Jesus Christ. I'm going to follow you. And when they receive that mark, this picture painted for us, what John sees is the, is the destiny of wrong decision. You and I make wrong decisions today. And you know what? When our life ends, they end. We make wrong decisions, and and we always have a chance to be redeemed. But during that tribulation time, those that receive the mark, they've made an eternal wrong decision. 
because they will, they will be tormented day and night for eternity. They miss out on everything. And you talk about grace. Look at the grace God has in our life. But look at the grace he has over anyone who just doesn't even take the mark. His grace is over them. Even if they, they, they don't even have to say, I trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. They just say, I'm not going to take the mark. I'm going to trust here, but I'm not, I'm not going to trust there. Then you're going to die. Then you died. You go to heaven. That's his promise. His grace has covered you. And his grace will continue to cover you for all of eternity. But you take that mark, and the consequences of, of those branded by the beast, the destiny of wrong decision is written down here for, our, for us to see. When I look at this, Throughout the Bible, we see that God's love is freely available to all men and women, everywhere and at all times. And we see it over and over again. God pleading with mankind to accept this message or to accept an escape from judgment he's made available through the sacrifice of his son. Straight through the word, God is pleading with mankind. Trust my son. Just trust my son. He'll see you through. Don't choose your way. Choose Yahweh, my way. Choose my son. God does it over and over. The, the continual urging of God throughout the scriptures is this. Don't allow yourself to come to such an end. I love you and I can provide everything you need. Love me and find the fulfillment your heart longs for. Yet here in Revelation chapter 14, where we see this picture of those who have received the mark of the beast, um, these are the ones that, that uh, what they're saying here is, no God, I don't want you to love me. I don't want your love. Okay, I will take the life you've given me and all the good things you provide, but I don't want you. All right, Lord, I will run my own life. I'll serve my own end and I'll rule my own kingdom. That's what the world is saying to God when they take the mark of the beast. And anyone who chooses to live their life in such a way God has maybe three choices, I think, um, to make in, face of such, in the face of such human rebellion. Number one, God can indulge an attitude like that. He can just indulge it and say, well, I'm just going to look past it and, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'm just going to, I'll indulge it. I'll allow it to go on forever, you know. But all the cruelty and all the injustice and all the hatred and pain and death that now prevails on the earth will go on forever too. And God doesn't want that, nor does mankind want that. Mankind wants peace. There'll be no peace outside of Jesus Christ. So when you have an attitude like that towards God, God can indulge it, but he's not going to indulge it because that means mankind will continue going on and they'll never be changed. And he does not want that. He can force mankind to obey him, right? He can control the human race as if we were a race of robots. But to take away our free will would be to take away our capacity to give our love to God freely. When I say, I love you, God, I have the freedom to say that before him. And any, anything, anybody that can, you know, the Antichrist is going to come in, he's going to demand worship. And people will begin to worship him because he's taken him captive. But as time goes on, they're going to find out that he's going to change his ways. And they're going to go, I can't worship you anymore. doesn't matter. You receive the mark, and I demand your worship. You will worship me. That is not how God works. God has given us free choice so that our love for him would be our choice. I choose to trust your son and to love you, Lord. That's the picture that's painted there. Love, the love of God, cannot be forced. He doesn't force his love on anyone. And the third thing God can do, and really this is only his real choice, 
It's what he does all throughout Scripture. It's painted for us. We've seen it. We've been in the Old Testament. We've watched the nation of Israel. We've, won, we've walked through First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. We've watched how God deals with rebellious people. What he does, he withdraws himself from those who refuse his love. You don't want my love? Then I'm backing away. Now, I will never not love you. But my love is not going to live in a rebellious heart because that is not how I want you to love others. You are going to make your heart grow cold. So I withdraw myself from you. That's what God does throughout all of Scripture. Since God, well, God is necessary to our existence. And the decision to reject God is a decision to plunge ourselves into the most terrible sense of loneliness and isolation a human being can ever know. And ultimately, it's, it is us who choose whether God will judge us. You look back at the nation of Israel, and it's the nation of Israel who chose to have God judge them because God gave out his promises. And he said, trust me, according to these promises. And they turned from those promises and began to trust themselves. And God sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet who they killed and murdered and strung up and cut in two. And finally, he said, into captivity you go into a place of isolation and desolation, and I have not led you there. I have given you my word so that you would know me and trust me. And you have brought yourself into this place. And while you're there and you begin to have families and children and all these things happen, he says, if you come back and call out to me at any time, I'll come and save you. I'll get you out of there. In fact, with, with the nation, he said, 70 years, I'll give you a time frame. But they brought themselves there, and we can bring ourselves into the same place. It is us who decide either to accept or refuse his grace, his love, and his forgiveness. It is us who choose everlasting life or everlasting death. Hey, choose Jesus Christ. And don't come to a place in your life like we see, this is the damnation and the doom of those who are branded by the beast. They are going to, for eternity, be in a place of torment and isolation. Ever been isolated? Desolate? Do you ever feel desolate? Do you ever have a broken heart? You know, how long does it last? Because you can make choices in your life and you can change the direction of your life. You can renew some relationships and ask forgiveness. You can ask Christ to come in your heart and fill you up. You can have that healed. But for those who receive the mark of the beast, you're talking about eternity with a broken heart. Eternity isolated and desolated for eternity. That means you won't die. You can't even kill yourself. You just live that way. And the whole time, knowing that you brought yourself there because of your own pride. That's the doom of those who receive the mark of the beast. And the amazing thing is, we have Christ. You know, a lot of people argue the point, what about predestination? This is the tribulation time. This is the end. You know, there's a beginning, and there's a middle, and there's an end. And we're just at the end. And as soon as the church comes up, oh, there's still seven more years. And during those seven years, the people who are going to be alive on, that earth, on the earth are going to face things you and I have never faced in our lifetime. Because we have the comfort of our spirit. So what do we do? By his grace, we share the gospel with each other. By his grace, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord to everybody we know. And we look foolish. Some receive the message, some don't. But we proclaim it anyway, because when we're removed from this earth, whenever that happens, what's left behind is whatever our testimony has been. And the untold millions 
that are going to come to Christ during the tribulation time were part of the witness that we lived. That means they saw our lives and somehow they realized, wow, God is real. Jesus Christ really was Lord. And they make that commitment. But to those who reject it, this is a doom that's really beyond human words. And I can only say what can be said, but it's beyond human words. When God says damnation, he means damnation. We say damnation, you know, it doesn't mean really anything to us. We go, oh, that's hell. The guy's going to go. You say to somebody, go to hell. You know what that means? You know what hell is? It's eternal damnation for eternity. It's, it's, it's living outside of the precious intimacy that the human heart so desires and never being able to grasp it and seeing it from far away and never being able to grasp it for eternity. And God is saying to you and I, hey, listen, I've covered your sins. I will never hold them against you because you trust my son. So, so just, just the person you are, go out and share my love with someone. Because I don't want any to go there. But some will go there in the stubbornness of their heart. And it's an amazing picture painted for us there. The doom of those who are, are branded by the beast. Look at verse 12. He says, here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors and, and, and for their deeds will follow them. Right? This is the promise of God to those who trust in Jesus Christ during that tribulation time. Because they, they have something to hold on to. Because they're not going to have the comfort of his spirit. They're just going to have to trust in, in what they can read. So it, this is the exercise of the saints. He says, it, it, patiently waiting upon the Lord for the destruction of the Antichrist and his empire. Do you know that that's the same picture given to us today? What's the purpose of the saints? Well, patiently wait on the Lord. Serving one another. Trusting the Lord knowing that I'm forgiven, praising him because of his grace that's over my life. Not living in fear on what the next step's going to hold for my life, but just praising God because of the grace he's put over my life. And Lord, just I, I'm patient. I can wait. I'm going to have you for eternity. I can wait on you and trust in you. When you tell me, hold off on that and wait on me on that, I can wait. Even if it's past my lifetime, I can wait. Because I'm going to be with you for eternity. And that's something that he's showing. Uh, John is trying to show, and God is trying to show through John, uh, to those who are facing death during that tribulation time. You patiently endure. Because God will destroy the Antichrist and his empire. And so you will die during that time. But patiently wait and trust the Lord. And, and blessed are you that die. He's saying, you're going to go to heaven. You're not going to miss out. So just endure. You know, sometimes we face heavy trials, don't we? Real difficult ones. Family members that aren't saved. Difficulties in the job. Just difficulties all around. Pressures that come in. How can I possibly keep loving that person? It's so hard. It's so difficult. How do I do this? How can I, Lord? And, and he's saying, just trust me. Maybe, the, maybe what's in front of you right now won't work out for your good. But maybe it'll work out for God's glory. Do you, are you with the Lord enough that, that his glory is, is your desire more than your good? I don't think that some of the martyrs that were eaten by lions back in the first century, they you know, really thought it was a joyful thing to do. You know, Lord, I am here for your glory and my good. <laughs> you know, um, God's like, how about my glory? Yes, I desire your glory more than I desire my good. Lord, that's where I'm at. 
So glorify yourself through my life. You know what God would say? Be patient and let me do my work. And trust me, I'll see you through. Hey, when God challenges you in an area of your life and he's saying to you, hey, lay that down, lay it down. And if you pick it back up again the next day, lay it down again. And if you pick it up again, lay it down again. Just keep laying it down. Stop feeding it. He'll see you through. His patience is unbelievable, right? Look how patient he is with me. Very patient. Look how patient he is with Pete. Oh, man. (laughs) He's patient with us. And he wants us to be the same way when we face difficulties. But this is a promise here. In fact, James writes in James chapter 1, he says, My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into to different kinds of temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. And let patience have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and sound, lacking nothing. Let God do what he's going to do in your life. And look at verse 14. Okay, now from 14 all the way down through 20, you have two harvests. A harvest is going to happen here. The harvest of the redeemed, those who have trusted Jesus Christ, and then you have the harvest of the rebellious. That's what we have here. Verse 14, I looked and behold a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put your sickle in, in and reap, for the hour of, of uh, the, to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And then he who sat on a cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And amazing. Verse 17. And out of the temple which is in heaven, he also had another sharp sickle. And then another angel, and the one who has power over fire came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, said, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. And the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. That's a lot of blood. That's a lot of blood spilled on the earth. So this is the harvest of the redeemed first. There's a sickle that comes down. It's Jesus Christ. And he takes his sickle and he cuts it down. And these are the ones who are saved through the preaching of the 144,000. These are the ones who have given their hearts to Jesus Christ During the tribulation time, he's saying, it's time for you to come be with me. And he takes him. Then you have an angel who has a sickle, and he says, you go down and you gather the clusters. And now the angels come down and they reap up all the bad stuff. That's the grapes. The grapes of the wrath of God. And they get tossed into this great wine press. And these are those who rejected the love of God, who trusted in the beast instead of God's son. And then we just read their fate and their doom. And it's horrific. And I don't think that God records this for you and I to read so we could look and go, wow, that's you know, a really good word. I think he gave us this so that we might begin to speak to others. And to let them know there is an end. And God's not fooling around. He gave us his son. So that we might trust him by faith. And the spirit and flesh thing. You just got to battle it for the rest of your life. Feed the right one. Stop feeding the flesh. The spirit will grow. Begin to lead you and direct you down the road God has for you. Learn to walk that way. And as you do, share with people. One of the greatest things you can do is share your testimony. And a testimony is not a big, long story. Maybe it's just what God did in your life yesterday. Maybe what God revealed to you of his son in the word that you're reading in the morning or during the teaching of a Bible study. A testimony is a simple thing. You know, I was, I was reading the Bible and God just showed me. I was... Hey, trust his son. That's what I'm doing. Real simple. One time I was driving my truck, and I stopped at this dock, 
and I had to go pick up. And as I'm in my truck, I'm praying. I'm like, Lord, help me just share your love with whoever's inside there. And, and God just pressed upon me to ask, to talk about this radio station that I was listening to, ask this guy about the radio station. Because I knew the guy, and I knew that he always listened to the station. And it was a, they shared something about a Christian movie that came out, and they were talking about the gospel and being saved. So I went inside, and the guy's name was John. So I'm just, I walked in, and I go, hey, John. He's like, hey, Ron. I go, hey, did you listen to that radio station? He's like, yeah, I did. I go, what do you think about that? He's like, well, I don't know. I don't know what to think about it. I go, what's it mean to be saved? He's like, well, you know, got to give your heart to Jesus Christ and ask him into your heart as Lord. And he goes through the whole salvation thing with me. And I go, are you saved? He's like, well, I guess, you know, I did it when I was like 20. And uh, he goes, no, I kind of just kind of walked away. I don't go to church anymore. He's like, are you saved? I'm like, yeah, I'm saved. And he's like, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. I'm like, yeah. And then I left. And then when I came back, it was a few weeks later, <laughs> things were changed. Things like, like the pictures in the bathroom were different now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Everything started changing. And it was really awesome. And before I ended up leaving there and becoming a pastor, he, he thanked me. He was like, hey, thanks, man. I'm like, for what? He's like, well, you brought me back to the Lord. I'm like, I didn't bring you back to the Lord. He's like, no, you did. You brought back something. I was like, hey, praise God. I didn't know that. I was just trusting the Lord. I don't, you don't have to get into this big 40-minute dissertation. I was such a wretched piece of trash, and God saved me. And I was like, no. What did he say to you today? What did he show you yesterday? Those things are real important because he shows you things not just for you. He shows them for those around you who need to hear what he is saying. Sometimes they are not listening. And if you are, share it. You don't know where it's going to go. And it doesn't even have to make sense. Just share it and let the seed be planted. God knows what the ear needs to hear. He knows what the heart needs to understand. He knows what only those eyes can see at that particular time. And you've got to trust him for it. But the picture here in Revelation 14 is a very strong one because it's a picture of eternal life and eternal damnation. And God saying, don't play games with your salvation. This is my son, Jesus Christ. Trust in him. And, and if you find, you know, if, if those that don't do that and the church is brought up into heaven to be with the Lord for eternity, there's seven years where the gospel is still going to be proclaimed even more powerful. You think of how powerful Billy Graham's ministry is. Think of that. I mean, how many reached? 20? 100,000? I mean, he reached a lot of people. Powerful. You think about 144,000 unstoppable Billy Graham's. In every nation, every tongue, every language, proclaiming to people the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's going to go out with an authority that we don't have. But we have an authority in the sinful state that we're at to trust Christ and share his love with people, that others can come to know him. And that's what God desires from you and I. He knows your sin, and he's given you his son. So don't be afraid. Trust him. If he shows you something in your life, hey, change that. Trust him. Say, Lord, I can't. I'm trying. I keep laying it down and it comes right back up again. God says, keep bringing it to me. Because one day you really will from the innermost being of your heart. Maybe right now you can only do it surface and you think you're deep. But you keep bringing it to me, and I'll bring you deeper and deeper and deeper. Stay in my word. Walk with my people. It's an awesome picture of hope to you and I. And I think a hope to the world that doesn't know Christ because there is an end. And for us, it's beautiful. For us, it's awesome. You know, when I get there, I'm going to have hair. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> I'm going to make sure it's long and flowing. <laughs> well, it's his choice. <laughs> you'll be there too. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us to look into your word. And Father, I ask that you take your word that was taught today, 
that you plant it deep in our hearts and let it begin to produce the things of your spirit. Lord, we desire to walk according to your spirit, not according to our flesh. And we always desperately need you to help us do that. So please, reveal your son every step of the way that we, like the 144,000, might follow him everywhere he goes, might keep our eyes fixed on him, beholding the broken, bloody Lamb of God who saved our souls. We thank you for the grace and mercy you've given us. Continue to lead us and have your way here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.